an imagined abstract line consists of infinitely many imagined abstract points. And since we believe we can imagine it, we accept it to be true. With the axiomatic approach of modern mathematics, it doesn't really matter how we define abstract objects like points and lines, as long as they don't lead to contradiction. We can call these definitions axioms, and then use rules of logic to see where they lead. But since we've used this principle to underpin core concepts like real numbers and lines in geometry, then if this is wrong, almost all of mathematics is wrong. Fundamental principles like these were often discussed by ancient Greek philosophers. They were exploring the nature of quantity, structure, space, change, and how we acquire knowledge. The word mathematics comes from the Greek language. But even after all this time, there is still no generally accepted description of exactly what mathematics is. In the ancient Greek battle to find the source of all knowledge, on one side of the fence there was one of the founders of atomism, Democritus. He believed that knowledge comes from the study of physical things. On the other side of the fence we have the founder of Platonism, Plato himself. He believed that knowledge comes from the study of metaphysical things, which are things that don't exist in the physical world. In Plato's idealised world, a line could always be divided into as many parts as you like. But Democritus had a clever counter-argument, derived from Zeno's paradoxes. Zeno was another Greek philosopher who had highlighted that time and motion could appear to be paradoxical. But unlike Zeno's paradoxes, Democritus's argument had no passage of time and did not involve any motion. First we'll consider Plato's idealised perfect line of length 1, and we'll make the dubious assumption that such a thing can exist. As well as being described as a single line, at exactly the same time it could also be described as several smaller lines all joined together. For example, it could be described as a line of length 0.9, followed by a line of length 0.1, without any distance between them. In the same way, it could also be described as a length of 0.8, followed by a length of 0.09, followed by a length of 0.01, and finally followed by a length of 0.1, all with no space between them. And since the whole length is continuous, there must always be a length immediately before the last length. So now let's suppose that we can divide the first 0.9 length into infinitely many parts, where each part corresponds to a decimal digit in the number 0.899999 and so on. Since the whole length is continuous, there must be a length immediately before the last length of 0.1, but that would mean that the infinitely many parts would have a last part, which forms a contradiction. Another consequence of the whole length being continuous is that somewhere between the first length of 0.8 and the trailing length of 0.1 there must be a place where the number of parts counted from the first part changes from being a finite value to being an infinite value. And so yet again this forms a contradiction. This argument is not restricted to just abstract objects, it can be applied to any claim of continuity, including any motion, any real world distance or length, any period of time, any real or imagined line, any geometric shape, and any concept of a number line or a continuum. By this argument even space itself has to be granular in nature. But if we try to imagine two smallest indivisible parts of space, then we automatically think of them as having a measurable space between them we find it difficult to accept that very small distances might only be measurable in terms of a number of smallest units of space. Also, any conceived geometric shape must be granular, so a perfect unit square cannot exist. Similarly, any conceived circle must be granular, so a perfect circle cannot exist. So are these real contradictions, or is there an explanation that we've missed? Well, perhaps we don't need to explain them, 
Perhaps we can insist it's not really a problem, we just don't understand it properly. So we can just call it a paradox and then claim that everything is consistent. An atomist like Democritus wouldn't be very happy with this approach. But this is the way that mathematics has evolved. When we encounter a problem, we devise a way around it in order to keep everything consistent. Avoiding problems might sound like a cop-out. For example, it may appear problematic to try to add up infinitely many terms, such as 0.8 plus 0.09 plus 0.009 and so on. But we can avoid infinity by defining the word sum to mean the limit of the corresponding sequence and then we can say the infinite sum is the rational value 9 tenths or 0.9. An atomist might ask us if the sequence is a finite length that is continually being extended or if it already pre-exists with infinitely many terms. The sequence cannot be a finite object that is continually being extended and so we have to concede that the sequence is infinite. And since its infinitely many parts correspond to the example that led to contradictions, the atomist might claim that our limit argument is flawed. But all we have to do is stand firm with our paradox argument and disregard his objections. Better still, we could tell him that he must accept all our rules first and then come up with a contradiction. On rare occasions, people do manage to find inconsistencies within our rules. One such person was Bertrand Russell. So we called his problem a paradox and we said you should just avoid doing things that would result in encountering the problem. So once again, consistency was maintained. Our approach is undefeatable. Yes, the mystical fundamentals of mathematics can seem strange, but it appears as though it does reveal wondrous things to us, like the imaginary number that is the square root of minus one. If our mathematics was simply a way of describing physical things, then we would never have discovered imaginary numbers. Instead, we might have described a scenario involving movement, where we have different signs for different directions. Indeed, a sign, just like a number, must relate to something in the real world. We might have all sorts of signs to mean different things, but we would never have devised a mystical imaginary number. However, we might have found many cases where a signed number multiplied by itself will get to a location corresponding to minus one. But most of us prefer the mysticism of Platonism, and we consider it unthinkable to even suggest it might be flawed in some way. We have vast amounts of highly complicated mathematics that surely have proven that the current way is the best way. Maybe the foundations sound a little dubious. But who cares? We'll just not worry about the dodgy foundations, and we'll point to our successes especially the more complicated stuff that can't easily be unravelled. We'll say it works, so it's proved its worth, and at the end of the day, that's all that matters. And so, is there any valid reason to doubt this concept of infinite divisibility? After all, most of us already accept the concept of infinity. And most of us have no doubt that abstract objects can be infinitely divisible. We accept the arguments that axioms need not make any sense, and we agree that maintaining consistency in our abstract world is all that really matters. We don't think that mathematics should be about modelling physical reality. We believe it's a wondrous metaphysical mechanism that reveals knowledge to us from beyond all physics. This video is brought to you by ExtremeFinitism.com